I wanted to thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon for our final plenary of the day on judging civil legal aid. I'm Caroline Fredrickson. I've met most of you before. I'm the president of ACS. Um, so the usual housekeeping is if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or put it on mute. Um, this session will be taped. So I, I, this is actually absolutely a perfect way to close uh, the day that we've had today because I think it really brings a lot of the pieces that we've talked about uh, over the course of this day um, and last night's discussion as well about inequality, income inequality in the law. And I think these judges um, have an incredible experience uh, in understanding what, um, what the needs are of low-income people in the courtroom and where lawyers can really make a difference. Uh, and in all sorts of areas, all sorts of practice areas that, where people can really uh, do whatever it is you want to do, whether it's your life career, whether you do it as pro bono, uh, or simply contribute to the organizations that provide these kinds of services. I think we are, this is a place where, for the American Constitution Society, I think it really brings it home about what we as lawyers can do for, for issues around income inequality. Uh, and the particular service we can provide. So we have a really exceptional group of judges who've been in the forefront uh, of addressing issues of civil legal aid in their courtrooms and in being leaders across the country uh, of discussing these important issues and advocating for improvements. So we have Chief Judge Eric Washington of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. We have Chief Justice Nathan Hecht of the Supreme Court of Texas. We have Chief Justice Ch Chase Rogers of the Connecticut Supreme Court. We have Associate Justice Goodwin Liu of the California Supreme Court. And we have Judge David Tatel of the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. So it's obviously a very uh, 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 distinguished group of judges, uh, not only for the, for, for the service that they do uh, in all the other areas, but um, for today's topic especially. So we could not have a better group for tonight's conversation. Uh, and this is really a timely one because this is the year that we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Legal Services Corporation, which will uh, be on July 25th. So thank you, judges, um, for being here with us today. So uh, over 60 million people qualified for civil legal aid in 2012 but over 50% of prospective clients were turned away from legal aid offices because of inadequate resources. Those who miss out on civil legal help face losing homes, children, food, life savings, and even physical safety and security. These are existential issues that face people in their everyday lives. But making matters worse, there is an unprecedented funding crisis for civil legal aid and for courts generally, which keeps disadvantaged populations underserved, and literally, as we've heard so many times, has actually closed the courthouse doors. However, there are new answers that are being provided to issues of civil legal aid. Um, so now we are gonna turn to some of those new ways of approaching these issues of providing services and hear from some of the innovative responses that these judges have helped spearhead uh, in their courts and, as I said, and around the country. So we're going to start with Judge, Chief Judge Eric Washington of the DC Court of Appeals, who is the chair of the Access, Fairness, and Public Trust Committee for the Conference of Chief Justices. So Judge Washington, could you tell us a bit about the role that chief judges are playing throughout the country on civil legal aid, which includes efforts around self-represented people, self-help courts, and unbundled services? Certainly. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here, especially to talk about this issue. Um, yes, the, the impact of this influx of unrepresented litigants has led us as chiefs to recognize that in order to provide the quality of justice that we believe all citizens deserve, we had to take steps to make sure that we were hearing the merits of their concerns and claims. We were understanding and actually resolving the problems they were bringing to us because if not, we were churning cases. It was not efficient for the courts. It certainly wasn't providing any relief for these individuals who came before us. And it was in fact impacting the community because as with most issues involving people in poverty, time is an enemy. 
So we needed to try to figure out how do we get to the merits of these issues and how do we change our business practices? How do we change our business model to accommodate what has because of the recession, because of rising legal costs, because of, of lack of education, because of language barriers, what has become such a significant part of most of our high volume, high volume courtrooms uh, in landlord tenant and small claims, in the areas you would expect people without resources to have to need, to need our services. And so the conversation began not amongst the chiefs, but amongst the legal service providers and those who have been in the trenches for a long time, um, those who are running clinics at law schools, those who are, as I said, involved in legal service provision uh, generally, and, and what, what we attempted to do initially, and, and probably exclusively, was to address our domain. What could we do that didn't require a lot of outside resources, nor did it require a lot of coordination? So I think one of the first things we did was we looked at the services we provided and we said we need help to help them, to help those individuals coming in. And we started, I think, a revolution around self-help representation centers. And we looked at our high volume courtrooms and we said, how can we make this better? Here in the District of Columbia and I think many other places, we were able to team with the bar, utilize the resources of the law schools, and we have riches beyond belief here in the District of Columbia. We've got uh, uh, more law schools in many states, uh, and they run clinics, although <laughs> clinics, of course, are difficult and expensive to run because of ABA standards and regulations which require uh, uh, high faculty to student ratios, uh, but, uh, or low, excuse me, <laughs> faculty student ratios. And, and, and so the, um, it, was a, it was all of those players, the bar through, the DC, through our bar pro bono program, which many of the organized and unified bars have, legal service providers and, and, and law schools coming together and saying, where's the need? How can, how can we help staff these centers and at least on site provide some level of, of information, understand and direct them in the right way? Of course, those people, if they weren't lawyers staffing those, staffing those self representation centers, and at the beginning they weren't all lawyers all the time, you know, the question about what legal what's legal advice and what's lay uh, advice and appropriate for people to provide to litigants was uh, a question. But we, 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 we made it through that and we involved the bar and created, I think, very robust in most of our court systems, self-representation centers. And we thought that was a good, pretty good deal. Um, but uh, we understood and recognized as we went along that it wasn't enough and uh, uh, up out of this conversation, uh, and it's, it started a while ago, but it caught, um, I think, uh, fire more recently, um, the, the idea of going beyond ourselves and asking and setting up and encouraging and oftentimes establishing um, what are known as access to justice commissions. And those access to justice commissions now, I think, established in 34 states approximately, um, and uh, I, my, my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Chief Justice, I just will give probably a little bit more information about that because she's been um, a, a leader uh, in that effort uh, nationally. But those access to justice commissions were established to bring all the players outside the court together to look at the entire mosaic of poverty and its impact on the courts and figure out where the best place to put our resources were and where we could find synergies and where we could bring people together to solve the problem. Uh, our Access to Justice Commission uh, is chaired by Peter Edelman, a member of the, uh, the board and uh, someone who is a renowned expert, uh, not only in poverty law, but in access to justice issues generally. And, um, and we have taken it and over the last uh, several years it has uh, provided needs assessment studies, it has worked with legal service providers to figure out how to collate, locate services, create interpreter banks so that we have shared resources to cut costs, to increase the outreach by talking to medical providers who in fact have vans that traveled around the city trying to figure out how to create partnerships. So there's a lot going on and I'm using the District of Columbia as an example, but it is representative of how chiefs around the country are taking steps to try to address a significant, serious problem in our courts. Recently, 
Um, I, following the lead of uh, Chief Justice Lippman in New York, to some degree have um, um, convened all of the law schools, and they are now acting, those representative, and we have uh, uh, Professor Morrison here and others who serve on that Access to Justice subcommittee of, or advisory committee of the Access to Justice Commission from law schools. They're working on ways that law schools can collaborate to provide more efficient service to encourage more law students to become engaged and involved in providing pro bono, pro bono services, and in, in essence, to try to help us close the justice gap. As I said, there are, uh, I'm looking down at my list, I'm not hitting all of them, but I would, could be here literally all, all night, and, and there's amazing things happening in Texas, Connecticut, all over the country. Is it making a difference? In the District of Columbia, still 90% of our uh, litigants are unrepresented at, with law, by lawyers, but to the courts and to the quality of the justice that they're able to receive because they're able to get the assistance. One of the other things judges are doing, what we did here in district, other chiefs are leading uh, revisions of their rules. We um, modified our rules, and, and when I say rules, not rules, really the, the judicial code of conduct to increase the opportunity for trial judges to level the playing field, to, to allow them the freedom without fear of violating our judicial code of conducts to actually, again, as we say, resolve the case on the merits. So our whole focus, our whole goal, and everything we're doing is trying to make sure that we actually get to the merits of all of these litigants' um, cases. Thank you. And, and you mentioned Texas, and obviously the District of Columbia has been a real leader, but so has uh, Chief Justice Nathan Hecht on the Texas Supreme Court, who is here to my right. Um, he's been an incredible leader on civil legal aid uh, in his home state of Texas. Um, Judge Hecht has talked about the need for increased state funding for legal aid services and has called equal access to justice, quote, essential to the rule of law. So I want to ask um, you, Chief Justice, um, is, you know, is, has your approach been different? Did you come into the issue for the same reasons um, that uh, Chief Judge Washington uh, and his court has, and, and sort of where, where are you going in Texas? Well, um, we do face many of the same problems. Um, Texas, the Texas Supreme Court has a long history of supporting uh, civil legal services and created the IOLTA program 30 years ago, as did a number of other states. Uh, then an Access to Justice Commission about 15, 14 years ago. Uh, and now that IOLTA funds have gone to nothing almost because interest rates are zero and have been for years, uh, we've gone across the street um, to the legislature and the governor's office to say we're going to have to have um, funding uh, for uh, legal services in Texas. Now, the poor are not a constituency, so they don't vote most of the time. They don't, they're not consumers. That's why, I mean, they're poor. Uh, and so they need a voice, a spokes, someone to speak for them. Uh, and uh, that fits well with the stewards of the justice system, the bar and the judiciary, uh, because we can go to legislators and say, this is why this is important, uh, legal services, basic legal services. Uh, to the functioning of the government of the state. Uh, so that this is not just uh, uh, some sort of program to help people that need it, which would be a good thing, but this is really something that is crucial. Uh, and um, a court can, uh, judges can make that pitch uh, because they see firsthand um, the uh, importance of providing legal services to the people. After all, I mean, a legal system that only the rich can afford is not much of a justice system. So uh, at the same time, uh, courts uh, can have a role in uh, encouraging the bar and inspiring the bar uh, to, to do their part, uh, which the bar uh, nobly has risen to that uh, cause. You, you know, we don't, we don't uh, ask the grocers to feed the poor and we don't ask the home builders to house the poor, but we do ask the lawyers uh, to represent the poor as part of their responsibility to the profession, and we have always done it. 
uh, and that's a good thing. Um, but now the level of poverty is so high, it's nearly, um, you said uh, uh, 60 million people in the United States and Texas has almost 10% of them. Uh, so uh, it's very important to be able to um, get legal services, services to these people. So it's, uh, all of the things Eric talked about are, are exactly right. So many people are trying to represent themselves these days. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, you represent yourself, you got a fool for a client. Uh, and uh, uh, people need, they need uh, legal services and it's just for basic things. Um, so we, we try to inspire the bar to do that, but we also try to um, impress upon the legislature and the Congress uh, the importance of an infrastructure, of legal aid lawyers, of storefront law offices, of 800 numbers and, and system, uh, systems whereby someone who needs help can get to a lawyer. You can't just call up the switchboard of Hogan and Hartson and say, <laughs> send me a lawyer. I mean, maybe they will, but, uh, but, you, but some way, t there are lots of Hogan and Hartson lawyers that would help, uh, but there needs to be a way to um, uh, hook the lawyer up with the client to close the justice gap that, we, that we're always talking about. Um, so that's, we're doing all of that uh, and I think all the states are doing their best to try to help. You know, what's been wonderful is having uh, conversations with the judges before we started was realizing how tight this community is and how these judges from across the country um, have been in communication and working together to address this problem. And, uh, uh, Chief Justice Heck raised the issue of pro bono, um, uh, and Chief Justice Chase Rogers of the Connecticut Supreme Court has been uh, a, a really a, a, quite a leader in that area, has arranged a statewide pro bono summit in 2011 <coughs> that was designed to address the overwhelming number of unrepresented individuals in domestic housing and other civil legal matters. And one of the things that came out of the summit was the creation of a pro bono, pro bono portal, which is, uh, I think speaks to the issue that you raised, whereby lawyers can identify pro bono opportunities in their area of law. And along with that portal, the summit arranged for the training for participants as well as malpractice insurance, uh, which is obviously a critical matter for uh, lawyers uh, uh, in taking on uh, these kinds of matters. And by 2013, the portal was actually receiving nearly 1,000 visits a month. And I think this is a particularly um, wonderful example for this audience because, you know, as I said in the opening, I think this is um, for those of you who are in private practice or the students who are in here, and I know there are many of you who are students, who are gonna go into private practice, this is a great way to engage. So. Um, I want to ask um, uh, Chief Justice uh, Rogers to talk a little bit about what brought the summit into being um, and um, how do you see these um, sort of the, 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 su the portal uh, leading into other sorts of new initiatives? Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me today. Um, just by way of background, Connecticut actually was early in trying to address the access issues, whether through self-help centers, et cetera. Uh, we had a whole strategic plan starting about eight years ago to try and deal with those people who are representing themselves to at least make the process a little bit easier for them so that hopefully we could achieve justice at the end of the day. The more I got into it, though, the more I began thinking that um, really people need lawyers and we can do all we can on the access issues, but at the end of the day, um, civil legal services uh, in Connecticut, they tell me that they can handle about 15% of the requests, legitimate requests that they're getting for help. So um, I felt it was important that the branch uh, really start working on this uh, in a very direct way. So as was mentioned by Caroline, uh, we did have our first pro bono summit uh, two years ago. Um, when we talked to people, we had focus groups and we said, well, what's the problem here? Why, why are why is the bar not doing more? Even though the bar in Connecticut is pretty active, but we want them, of course, to do as much as possible. And they had three complaints. One was, we don't know what's out there that we can do. Uh, two, um, how am I gonna get trained, for instance, on the family side, if, if I'm a complex commercial litigator uh, and you want me to go in and handle a, a divorce or uh, uh, an abuse situation? 
Uh, and three, what happens if something goes wrong? And I knew from personal experience, having come from a very large firm, that that really was one of the primary concerns was, is there going to be malpractice coverage? So we looked at all that. We worked, we then collaborated with not only with law schools uh, and the bar, um, corporations uh, were very, very helpful to us in, try, in figuring out the best way to go about doing this, as well as nonprofits. And so the end result was we had a pro bono summit where we invited, we, we, it was by specific invitation, the leaders of the law firms uh, and the corporations and the legislature, including the governor, we were able to get him to attend, which was, I thought was an important piece of it. Um, and we unveiled at this summit, um, this pro bono portal, which as you were saying, there's about a thousand hits a month, and it tells you if you're interested in kids, here are the things you can do, here's who you call. If you're interested in veterans affairs, here's who you call, all the way down the line. So it makes it very simple to get started at least. Um, and as Bill Bright, who is a, a colleague of mine who really headed up the logistics of the effort said, Put that portal as an icon on your computer so that when you have 15 minutes, you can go in and see, oh, here's something I might be able to work on. Then we worked with legal services very closely. They said they would be happy to provide the training in a number of areas, as well as our judges. And our judges have been very active in going out and saying, okay, here's a restraining order, here's how you do it. And we actually will go to the law firms and teach them how to go about doing it. Um, if it's a bigger issue such as uh, Homelessness, legal services obviously is the expert in that area and they, they will help teach and train. And then the final piece of it, which um, the corporate folks were able to figure out for us was, if it went through the pro bono portal, the referral, there was a way to do it so that legal services was in, in effect providing malpractice insurance for anybody who was assigned a case. So that took care of that problem. The result has been, it's been uh, extremely successful. And then the final piece that I wanted to mention was we had our second pro bono summit, because you want momentum, right? Um, two years later, so about uh, six weeks ago. What we did this time, which I thought was fairly clever, was that we, we didn't want the head guys anymore. We wanted them to identify who their shining stars were, who were going to really you know, carry the mantle at this point. And so we had about 100% attendance again, and we continued to talk about initiatives and things that we could do um, to make sure that as many people as possible are represented in Connecticut. Well, I, I, the segue was impossible to not to exploit. So speaking of shining star, um, I'd like to turn to Justice Goodwin Liu of the California Supreme Court, um, who is also a member of the State Commission on Access to Justice. And uh, that commission um, was instrumental in establishing a $10 million equal access fund for civil legal, civil legal services for the, for the indigent. And the equal access fund provides a variety of web tools for legal services operators and pro bono lawyers, uh, including technological, ethical, and limited English profici proficiency resources. So I want to ask um, Justice Liu, um, you know, we, you have a model commission. Um, you know, what, what are the innovations that you think have been most successful that could be modeled in other states? Um, and where do you see this commission going in the future? Great. Um, thank you, Caroline. And uh, it's nice to be back at another ACS convention. Um, in addition to the pleasure of being in this um, very impressive panel of judges, I just can't help but remark that I've always wanted to be between two ferns. <laughs> And, and if you don't get that joke, you got to ask someone who's under 30, and they'll <laughs> tell you what that's about. Um, all right, so I, I think uh, I'll answer your question, but I'd, I'd like to put it in a little broader context um, and talk about the kinds of things that we're doing on our Access to Justice Commissions but situated in a little bit bigger picture about why is it that we have this immense justice gap in our country? Why are there so many unmet legal needs um, in our country? And I want to do this by way of a little, more like issue spotting and give us um, maybe provocatively a little more, th a few more things to talk about. And I have sort of three buckets of, um, uh, let's say they're problems, you know, uh, dimensions of this problem. 
uh, of which only the third will concern what we've just been talking about so far. The first is that we shouldn't forget that um, there is what I will call um, the substantive law of access to justice, which is to say there are all kinds of um, things in state and federal law and legislation that structure how claims get brought and who can bring those claims. So here, you know, consider just the most obvious uh, one, class actions. Uh, class action law structures tremendously who has access to justice in this country and how state and federal courts as well as state and legislatures in the Congress think about uh, that body of law makes a huge difference to, for example, uh, low-income uh, working people who uh, perhaps have uh, uh, discrimination problems, uh, uh, wage theft problems, um, all kinds of labor and employment uh, uh, statutory issues, right? And that's a very active area of litigation. That also affects things like people who suffer uh, environmental hazards in a community, toxic torts. I mean, you can think of any array of problems. Think about another dimension of this, fee shifting. Uh, fee shifting is a tremendous uh, uh, policy uh, lever uh, with respect to access to justice, and that has been narrowly, broadly crafted and interpreted by legislatures and courts. Arbitration uh, and other forms of ADR, um, to what extent can uh, policymakers create rules that ensure that arbitration really is uh, accessible, affordable, uh, speedy, just, fair, all of those important values, right? And so the, I think, you know, for all of these strategies, there's a very important balance to be struck between uh, ensuring access to justice and obviously preventing or forestalling frivolous litigation or being an overly litigious society. But anyway, that's one bucket of thing that if you're concerned about this issue, we should you know, perhaps also be talking about. And by the way, as a footnote, I would just say in general, um, our country, uh, our society is a fairly law-dense society. We have a lot of law. Um, think about just you know, as one example, in the schools context, um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, IDEA. Very salutary law, very good purposes, but anytime you create a legal regime, right, it means that in order to actually make rights real, uh, you then create a barrier, which is that someone then has to go figure out how to enforce those rights, and then in IDEA we see evidence, some evidence, that who, who actually gets IDEA rights enforced? Those people who can afford to uh, advocate for their children or get a lawyer to advocate for their children, that creates a certain kind of justice gap. So those of you who are in policy ought to think about when you design a system or design rights, you know, great in theory, right, but how do you make it actually real? Okay, so that's substantive law of access justice. The second bucket, which is also, I think, um, important, is what I'll call regulation of the legal profession. Um, and here I'm gonna borrow a lot of stuff from a USC um, law professor and economist named Jillian Hatfield, who's probably the leading expert in this area. And this goes to how does the legal profession construct itself? And I'm gonna be careful here because state Supreme Courts have a big role, actually. When, you, when the title of this panel is called Judging Civil Legal Aid, literally it means the state courts have to judge who gets into the profession, who doesn't. But, the, the primary thesis here, if I can paraphrase uh, Professor Hatfield, is that we have to figure out ways to lower the cost of accessing law. I'll give you a few numbers to set up the problem. So uh, some of the surveys will tell you that um, in, across America today, roughly every year, uh, households get about, average household gets about 3.6 hours of legal help related to civil legal problems. And on average, a, a family uh, has about two dispute-related problems a year, so that comes out to an hour and 40 minutes of legal help for each problem that they have. Obviously, that's not very much, uh, especially when you're talking about things like custody, divorce, family law, access to benefits, immigration, what have you. And that number is almost surely an underestimate of the problem because that just deals with problems that have materialized. That doesn't go to the legal aid that would have been helpful to prevent those problems in the first place. The cost of, of uh, accessing legal aid, uh, if you're a middle-income family that doesn't qualify for uh, uh, legal aid in the traditional sense, 
is uh, very high. Um, solo practitioners, um, the lowest rates you'll find are between $150 to $200 an hour. You know, nobody pays that much, and uh, no, nobody wants to pay that much. Um, if you were to provide just one hour of legal help to all Americans for some dispute-related problem, it would cost at these rates $50 billion a year. And currently, we invest in civil legal aid only $3.7 billion every year, less than 10% of that $50 billion figure. I'll give you one more statistic, which is the one I think is most compelling in this regard. So uh, Professor Hatfield calculates that Legal aid lawyers and public defenders account for just 1% of all legal effort that's made in the United States every year. And if you add in the fact that lawyers do perhaps 30 hours of pro bono work every year, that's just 2% of all legal effort. If every lawyer in this country did 100 more hours of pro bono work every year, that would just be enough to give every American less than 30 minutes of uh, dispute-related help. Okay, so the thesis here is that the way we practice law in brick and mortar, face-to-face, uh, -face, in-person uh, settings, the traditional way, is structured uh, to, in a sense, um, we're constrained uh, in our service delivery mechanism. And so one very important challenge, I think, for the profession, and here I won't opine because these are actually matters in, in actual litigation and proposals that come to the state Supreme Courts, is, is to think about whether we ought to rethink uh, that model. And uh, there have been a lot of proposals. I'll give you just a couple examples. Um, Professor Hatfield's a, an advocate of, uh, of corporatizing the practice of law. That sounds scary, uh, but what she's talking about is the way in which the analog would be medicine. How medicine has figured out ways to differentiate function so as to triage uh, needs to the lowest cost provider. Uh, so not everyone sees a doctor for your problem. There are um, uh, physician's assistants, there are nurse practitioners, there are nurses, there are, uh, there are counselors, there are other people in the delivery mechanisms and you move people up to where they, where they need. Um, there are some benefits to this. There's benefits of uh, specialization, there's benefits of branding, there's benefits of efficiency, there's benefits of scale, right? There's also some negatives. We're all familiar with them, right? Uh, think about doctor autonomy and HMOs. You know, what would be the analog analogous problem in the corporate setting for the practice of law? Uh, what about choice? You know, so there's, there's just a lot of things to figure out there, but that's one idea on the table. A second idea which was mentioned was um, unbundling. Uh, so unbundling is an interesting idea of, uh, so, you know, our typical model is that it's all or nothing. You know, when you're in a client relationship, it's an all-encompassing relationship. Are there ways to parcel out pieces of a representation for filling out forms, um, a, a ghost writing a brief, or um, uh, sometimes contacting your adversary, whatever, what have you, that can be parceled out from full-scale representation to more, uh, to make more economical, uh, partial engagements that can still be of help to people, just not full scale. Give me another example. Washington State uh, was not represented on this panel. Uh, two years ago, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an order by the state Supreme Court, created what's called, what they call limited license legal technicians, okay? This was heavily fought over in the state of Washington, and indeed the order was a six to three opinion, three dissenters, right? And it was opposed by the state bar to create a cadre of licensed professionals who uh, are trained in certain education requirements, who can, uh, again, differentiation of function, they can provide limited technical help with certain kinds of things, especially filling out forms, informing clients of procedures, uh, explaining pleadings, identifying documents that may be needed in court and such, okay? Um, lastly, I wanna say, we ought to think about the role of technology, right? Um, uh, we don't have an equivalent of, you know, TurboTax for, uh, for consumers of legal services. I'm not advocating we do that thing, but, you know, there are these innovations. There's LegalZoom, there's Rocket Lawyer, there's all kinds of uh, things that can bring um, law, you know, to the masses in a way, and we have to think about how to do that uh, if we're going to do it in a responsible manner. Okay, so this, I would say, the second bucket is a big 
piece of debate right now in terms of structurally, how should the profession look? Um, should it be more open? Should we think about these innovations? And it's hard to think of another professional sector that has managed to achieve efficiencies and greater service delivery without some substantial organizational innovation, and lawyers have been traditionally, I think, quite resistant to that kind of thing. So lastly, let me answer your question about what we can do within the conventional paradigm. And, and there's a lot. I mean, there is a lot we can do, and you've heard already some of it. Our Access to Justice Commission has actually been inquiring about this whole panoply of issues. Um, I've been involved in a particular initiative uh, which has been generously supported by um, Mary McClymont, who's here from the Public Welfare Foundation based in D.C., as well as the Ford Foundation in New York, which is developing these, um, what we call uh, incubators, which are essentially uh, a model of how to get um, young graduates from law schools into what I like to think of as community lawyer roles. This is not legal aid. This is law for middle-income people or lower middle-income people. And what we're trying to do, I think the model is, to reduce the startup and overhead costs um, that are associated with training, mentoring, developing business plans, doing the accounting, doing a lot of things on the business side that you don't learn in law school so that young graduates can more quickly uh, develop solo or, or small group practices that aren't charging exorbitant rates uh, but are charging enough to help the lawyers uh, make a decent living. And if you think about that, there has to be a subsidy in there somewhere and the law schools, the law firms, the bar associations, the legal aid organizations are trying to figure out you know, what's the right way to build that, um, that building so that there is, uh, through some combination of in-kind and cash subsidy, enough so that these young lawyers can get um, a client base, develop a, a sufficiently lucrative practice, and no one's going to get rich doing this. But you know what? Most uh, attorneys, I think, by the time they get to uh, midlife, realize that you know, making a mint was not the reason they went to law school, and it's not what makes them happy. Um, doing what is purposeful and what is of service to people is what makes them happy, and we're just trying to help them get there sooner rather than later. That was, that was terrific, um, good one. You know, I, I want to drop a little footnote here um, as we go um, to our final um, panelists before we open up for a more engaged conversation. Um, I don't know if we've had an ACS event where we've had judges on a panel where one judge was a law clerk to one of the other judges on the panel. So this might be a precedent um, for ACS, um, uh, but it's absolutely terrific. And Judge uh, David Tatel, who's also with us from the DC uh, Circuit Court, uh, had served as general counsel of the Legal Services Corporation. And after graduating from law school, uh, almost immediately began pro bono work for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Um, has called repeatedly for the legal profession as a whole to be more involved in civil legal aid. In addition to giving money, uh, law firms, you have said, should do more pro bono work and advocate on behalf of greater public funding for legal services. So, you know, Goodwin put a lot of um, issues on the table uh, about some of the, the, the challenges um, that are faced um, in providing legal services. What do you, what are the factor or what is the factor or factors that you would identify as some of the greatest challenges and, and what are your thoughts about dealing with them? Speaking uh, last uh, reminds me of the golden rule of the Klondike. You know what it is? <laughs> For the last sled dog, the one at the end of the line, the scenery never changes. <laughs> now, that's not true of the last of this panel. In fact, listening to Justice Liu, um, are, um, I'm, I'm pressed to figure out what to add. <laughs> and one thing we might do here to be productive is to simply spend the rest of the time talking about his three points. Uh, but I will uh, amplify uh, pick up on one of his points, his second one <clears throat> about the structure of the legal system and the profession and the way it provides services. And I just want to add one uh, thought about that that I think is a serious obstacle to our ability to uh, meet the legal needs of the people in this country who need them. And that is that the legal profession views a uh, views a lawyer's obligation or views lawyers' obligations 
to meet the legal, legal needs of the poor, to provide services to those who can't afford them. That's the way the model code describes it. It views that responsibility as an individual lawyer responsibility. And it specifies uh, a number of hours that each lawyer should uh, devote and uh, specifies that each lawyer should provide funding to legal services. Doesn't say how much. Um, I think this is the big problem because, as Justice Liu said, uh, th there's no way that uh, that arrangement can meet the legal needs of the poor in this country. You just can't do it. Uh, uh, specifying that number of hours and a little bit of money from all the lawyers simply won't come close. Um, I mean, as valuable as pro bono services are, uh, as as uh, as exciting as it, I, I I see in the D.C. Circuit some of the very best pro bono work in the country, uh, but even with that and even with um, all of the funds we have for legal services, this isn't going to come close uh, to meeting the legal needs of the poor. In fact, the 80 percent figure that everyone uses has remained constant for I don't know 20, 30 years. Um, and as we know from uh, Chief Judge Washington, it's even higher in Washington, D.C. So my thought is uh, that uh, the only way to make significant process here, uh, progress here is for the profession itself to move beyond seeing uh, meeting the, lead, the, the need, legal needs of the poor as an individual responsibility to seeing it as a professional responsibility. Uh, and I don't need to spend any time here explaining why lawyers have that responsibility. Chief Judge Heck said it better than I could. Um, we, the profession does have the responsibility, and what I think should happen is that the legal profession should, uh, should declare, uh, through its various organizations, a goal, an institutional goal, of meeting the legal needs of all people who need them. Now, um, obviously, it can attempt move towards that goal by supporting funding for legal services, which it does. Uh, it can continue to identify you know, individual goals for individual lawyers. It can continue to promote pro bono work. But it must go further than that. It must do nationally what many of the access to justice commissions have done state by state which is identify exactly how much legal services are needed, where they're needed, and organize themselves to meet that need. Now, that will include dramatically more funding from the legal profession for legal services. You know, they can, they can, they can advocate in Congress and state legislatures as much as they want, aren't going to succeed in producing much more public money. If the money's gonna come anywhere, it needs to come from the legal profession, and the legal profession has the resources to meet those needs. In 2012, according to the census, the gross revenues of the legal profession were $240 billion. $240 billion. Um, one quarter of 1% of that would produce $600 million for public legal services. The state of Massachusetts uh, recommends that each lawyer give 1%. Uh, so imagine what 1% would produce. My point here, and this would have an insignificant impact requiring this kind of contribution on the earnings of individual lawyers, insignificant. Yet, uh, by having the legal profession step up to the plate and adopt this as a professional goal and finding some way to tax itself to provide the funding, which it has, would actually move us towards uh, a day when Everyone in this country, poor or otherwise, who needs a lawyer, uh, could actually get one. Thank you. I, I, 
think that Judge Tatel just summarized what I like to think of as the mission of ACS. Um, uh, we don't to have as much money. <laughs> well, we we don't, but we we believe that the law should be a force uh, for good in the lives of all people, uh, and it shouldn't be dependent on one's uh, income status. Um, so I, I'd like to go back to some of the issues that Goodwin raised, um, uh, and in particular, because uh, we have of our approximately a thousand people who have been registered for this convention, we have 233 law students, uh, and from 97 law schools. Uh, and so I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about the role of the law schools uh, uh, and in, a, in a number of different ways. One is we've talked a little about law school clinics and whether or not, um, how effective they can be and whether there's some issues about um, uh, uh, the, the, the cost burden uh, of constructing them and where, whether you're thinking that there could be revisions and how they could be regulated. Um, we've talked about the incubators, uh, uh, and uh, I think other people refer to it as sort of a low bono kind of, of, of opportunity. Um, I think, you know, we certainly see a lot with law students now that their um, the legal profession is hiring fewer people and that we want to think about ways where people can pr pursue a legal profession. And so incubators and low bono opportunities are one way that people can go out and hang out their own shingle or work with a small group of people and, and serve, um, serve clients of more modest means than some of the big law firms um, might do because of the affordability. So sort of where, what's, what is the law school role in that? Um, and maybe this is um, uh, uh, too provocative um, and so you don't have to answer it if it, if it is um, not appropriate, but I wonder about law school education. Um, and does that play into um, the provision of legal services? Is the structure of law school education both too expensive so that people come out with large debts and have a hard time serving these populations? And does it teach law students enough to be able to serve these clients? Maybe the incubator is one way of addressing those training needs, but should we be also looking at starting earlier, not just clinics and law schools, but also thinking of, of either shorter law schools, less expensive law schools, or specific more uh, training in advocacy in the law schools. And I open that to all the judges to comment on any pieces of those that you might like to. <laughs> Judge Washington? Oh, oh go ahead, Eric. Um, I, I don't have a view um, on the structure. I think there are pros and cons to the arguments that uh, law school for three years may not be the best um, way of structuring the legal education. Perhaps it should be less than three years. Perhaps there should be more opportunities, clinical opportunities or practicums that are offered. I know that we encourage as much as we can, and I have, I, I meet with the deans of all of my, of the law schools in the District of Columbia on a regular basis, at least once a year, to talk about uh, sort of what's going on in legal education. And, 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 and there is a significant um, disparity in their views. And you can imagine that law schools, like other institutions, have um, strengths um, that they want to promote, and those strengths sometimes would argue in favor of, of traditional legal education, and others have perhaps not in that uh, the vision of, of law schools and how they're rated, not as many strengths, and they may have a, a, a profound interest in, in changing it, um, but they have to worry about how, there are two things. One, they have to produce, of course, competent lawyers, young people, trained minds, ready to become good lawyers. Um, but they also have to make sure that they have uh, the kinds of student bodies that will continue to support their institutions and, and move them in a the direction they want. So it's a very, very difficult question if you start talking about legal education. I leave that to uh, there are people better able than I am. I will say, however, that when you're talking about the justice gap, law schools can provide a critical, can provide critical assistance and, and, um, and Certainly, again, there are limitations, but part of what we've talked about with respect to law schools is culture. Law schools can play a huge role in developing the kind of culture that will lead to the type of institutional change that uh, Judge Tatel is talking about because 
while some students, and a good number of them, come in, and I know I did, and many others, came in with a real sense of, of public interest and the importance and the, and, and the privilege of practice, um, it needs to be part of a cultural change so that we get to the point, perhaps, where, as Judge Tatel has suggested, the, the legal profession may be the ones that have to step up and finance and support the provision of legal services for all those people who need them. So there are roles to be played. Some um, um, more aggressively can be played more aggressively in different jurisdictions and different environmental circumstances than in others. So I don't profess to have a kind of a global idea of, of how law schools can operate and, and operate to help us deal with this issue, because again, law schools are there to educate to the extent they can help us close the justice gap. I think it's critical to, to the extent that they can provide us with the type of um, culture, culture change that raises the significance of these representations and the need to assist people generally, and that that's part of your role and privilege and obligation as a lawyer that's a great benefit. I, I just add one thing, which is that um, it, um, it was, I found very interesting what um, Judge Tatel said about the profession taxing itself, not just because I was his former law clerk, <laughs> but um, <laughs> actually um, the, the Washington State limited license uh, legal technician position, um, if you go look up the uh, divided court's order, six to three I mentioned, establishing this, um, that was what the dispute was about. It was about who would pay for it. Um, and indeed, the three dissenting justices on that court said um, that the uh, state bar should not have to tax itself to support this um, new position. It, it was interesting. It was exactly what, what Judge Taylor was just talking about. Um, and, and that's not because, I don't want to say that that's because the bar doesn't believe in it. Actually, that's a bar that's done a lot of good things, including all the things we've been talking about here. Um, so anyway, this, this is a bigger, bigger fight. Um, with respect to law schools, I would say um, a couple things. Uh, so we've seen some changes uh, that, that track bigger trends that are going on in, in uh, legal education. Um, you know, uh, Chief Judge Littman in the New York Court of Appeal, you, you all know, um, has uh, successfully pushed through a, a 50 hour pro bono requirement for admission to the New York Bar. Um, we'll see how that uh, turns out for New York. Um, that is, I think, very consonant with the general idea that um, there's a greater emphasis on experiential and practical training in law schools today, partly economically motivated because um, Law firms and the clients whom they serve are uh, in increasingly unwilling, essentially, to pay a first-year associate the exorbitant rates that you first-year associates make um, to essentially do things that they think you should have learned to do in law school. And this has been a constant you know, in, in ebb and flow over time is what should law schools do, what should firms do. And law schools think that the firm should do the training and we provide basic, and then the other side says, no, no, you guys are, you know. So, so this is, I think the pendulum has swung, though, a little bit in the current era towards the law school having to pick up more of this responsibility. And I think some of that can be leveraged towards the assistance of modest means and, and low-income people. One thing that I want to put on the table, which, um, um, so if you think about legal education, um, and going back to the three buckets of problems that I mentioned at the outset, certainly you can take courses that examine from the standpoint of civil procedure or legislation, the business about uh, substantive law of access to justice, right? So there's lots of courses about um, uh, you know, civil procedure, arbitration, these kinds of things. There, you can take legal ethics, which we're all required to do in law school and learn about pro bono and, and our um, commitment uh, to fulfilling the legal needs of, of people who can't afford it. What there is not, um, or at least not required, and probably not offered uh, in many places, what there is not is a serious discussion of the second bucket, 
Imagine if the legal ethics requirement of law schools, as part of learning that course, which we're all required to do, contained within it a module that required students to be educated about the economics and regulation of the legal profession. I'm not gonna take a view one way or the other about how that should change, but the fact is that we don't even have a conversation about it because it's not taught in law schools. What is this profession that we send our students off into? How is it organized? What is its history? Um, how does it uh, deliver services? Um, and quickly, I think, if you ha begin that conversation, it dovetails very quickly, I think, with many of the themes we're talking about today. And then if every law student in America had to engage these issues and learn about them, I think we'd have a broader conversation about the nature of the profession and how it does or does not live up to uh, its, its general commitment to provide legal services to all who need, who need it. So as one curricular idea, um, can't we put that idea into the, legal ethic, the standard legal ethics course? Um, and, and as you think about all these things, you quickly realize how many vested interests there are in how we do things the way we do, and why is it that these things don't change? If, if I can just turn the conversation a little bit to follow up on something that Judge Tatel said. Um, I, I hope that the bar is gonna take these steps. Frankly, I'm not sure if the judicial branches around the country have time for that to happen. And so I think that the state's uh, judicial systems have a real obligation in this regard to try and figure out until the bar does it, uh, what needs to be done. And I think we do need to be the leaders in it. And so, um, you know, I just, I wanna keep the focus on that. I think that's, that's very important uh, to the conversation. Um, well, I, I take Judge Tatel's good point. Um, in about a, 10 years ago, uh, I helped get a $65 fee passed um, for all the 90,000, then 90,000, close to 100,000 now, members of the State Bar of Texas. Uh, there was some reaction against that. Um, murderous might be a <laughs> fair uh, characterization of it. So if I were gonna suggest to the uh, uh, Texas Bar that we are going to uh, charge them 1% each for legal services, um, I want to have life tenure, uh, Judge Taylor. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I have it. That's why I proposed that. <laughs> <laughs> and a good and a good security detail. Uh, uh, but um, I I, I, uh, I do think the bar uh, needs to be challenged. This is a noble calling. It's uh, it's part of what uh, it is to be a lawyer. We all think that. I do think, though, too. Um, that it is part of the public's responsibility, that it should not fall entirely uh, on the profession. And uh, so apropos the 40th anniversary, 40th birthday of, uh, of uh, the Legal Services Corporation, it's um, worth pointing out uh, how much good they've done over the years, not only bringing attention to the problem, but also uh, directing resources uh, uh, to it, so uh, it one of the rewarding things is seeing that the other two branches of government recognize that this is a problem, that the lawyers are trying to do something about it, and that the public should help. And uh, I, uh, as much as as hard as we should try to bridge the justice gap, I think it's. Uh, good to ask for support from them. Well, you, you take me to the next question I wanted to ask, which um, uh, Chief Justice Heck may, may be most pertinent to you, um, considering the District of Columbia and Connecticut um, and California are, I wouldn't call them one party states, but they're less, uh, they're a different complexion than Texas, say. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and. You know, le civil legal aid has, has, has been a traditionally nonpartisan issue. Um, and I know you all bring to it your passion for justice, uh, and, and that's, that's your, the basis for your advocacy. But as a tactical matter, um, do you, as advocates for uh, uh, 
more funding uh, in your jurisdictions. Are, are, you, are you making arguments? We heard some arguments um, or a, a, a talk last night from a, a young man who, who works uh, in dealing with over-incarcerated populations. And, I used some, some tactical arguments about the, the, the financial burdens on the taxpayer um, of that regime, and I imagine, obviously, um, and there probably have been you know, many, many financial calculations about the uh, additional costs uh, to, the, to the system overall of unrepresented uh, 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 people in civil actions. So can you speak a little bit to, is that, is that one of the main sort of tactical arguments? Are there other arguments? How do you advance a cause like civil legal aid in the different environments that you're in, and and what are the what are the do you think the best arguments that you know that our advocates out in the audience can carry on on your behalf and on behalf of all of these underrepresented or unrepresented people? Well, the 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 two I make to most to the best effect are that first that this is uh, just good government. It's the rule of law now. It's not. This is not about politics, it's not about partisanship, it's it not, uh, it's just about if you're gonna have a rule of law, if you're gonna promise its benefits, uh, then it, it simply cannot be based on uh, wealth. It's, there's gonna have to be some uh, access by everybody uh, to it, if it's really a rule of law. That, I think that's a, a powerful argument because I think it works um, Regardless of your party, regardless of your political view, uh, it's just a strong argument. The second argument, and again, like we've been discussing here, is that the bar is doing its part. So the first reaction of the second branch to me is, this is a lawyer problem, they should take care of it. And when I point out to them uh, the number of hours that the bar is contributing uh, for free, uh, the the uh, sometimes we don't look at this, but Texas has done a survey. Some, a lot of lawyers who take uh, uh, pro bono cases just go ahead and pay the filing fee. They just go ahead and if the deposition has to be taken, they just pay for the court reporter. They out of their own, you know, they don't try to get reimbursement for that. They just do it, uh, which is not a whole lot of money, um, but in thousands of cases, it ends up being a lot of money. Uh, and uh, so to tell them uh, that the bar is doing its part is, uh, I think, a very powerful argument. Uh, aside from the philosophical argument which you've just relayed, I, we had a very practical one. When the Ulta funds, we at a high, we had $20 million going to civil legal aid. Um, from the Ulta funds, it dropped to $2 million, and they really were in a panic. I mean, they were gonna have to basically lay off everybody. Um, so what we did is we went to the legislature, the branch, and said, we'll help you do it, which that's the most appealing, right, politically to them. Uh, we will raise our fees modestly, which we have not, had not done for a, a prolonged period of time. And as a result, it's now back up to about $13 million, which they can at least, you know, do part of their job with that kind of money. Uh, the goal is that it will go back up to $15 million this year. So we had to, in essence, the branch had to come up with the money for the legislature to support it. I just want to say that this is not a go in one time shot. I, I, I am, um, you know, again, have the pleasure of having an, a very active, um, not only bar with a great deal of members uh, who are participating very heavily in pro bono, but um, the leadership of uh, our Access to Justice Commission works very closely with the leadership of our bar to tell the story. And they tell it in ways that politicians understand because it's their constituents and we're telling real life stories about the domestic, the, the, the person who was a, a victim of domestic violence. And it's not when I go along with the superior court chief, our trial court chief judge and, ju and, and, and the chair of our access to justice commission and the head of our DC bar pro bono program, we testify asking for funds as a group and we try to bring that reality, the, the personal stories to them. But in the interim, we are, the members of our Access to Justice Commim Commission, the members of our bar and other interested constituents in the District of Columbia at least, talk 
to their legislators on a regular basis and don't wait for that one appropriations period to have those conversations. And we do talk about the costs. There are enormous costs associated with, to the government else otherwise. You know, if you get representation in court that can assist and prevent you from losing your home, the domino effect that is stopped, you know, the, of, of what happens to the family and the shelters and the, stamp food, the, 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 the loss of employment because you've lost your home and can't get to work, and therefore the other social benefits that the government has to bear is, in, is, 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 is very disparate. I mean, you, you can put a little money here and you can save yourself a lot of money there. New York's done a great study on it and their study's been done in, in many other jurisdictions. So there is the economic argument, but there is the, 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 the stories and, 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 and it's important that they understand that, that it's their constituents that you're there to help protect by ensuring that the rule of law is honored and respected and, and, and ensured for, for, their, for their citizens. So I would say there's a lot of great arguments. I think going in there with sort of a, as I said, having the bar sitting next to you, having the judiciary who's, who's explaining to them uh, why it's important and the importance of the rule of law, the bar talking about what the bar is doing. We have, uh, Judge Tatel can tell you, we have a raising the bar campaign uh, in which we have firms contributing that 1% of their, of their income, growth of their, uh, their firm's income, and these are large firms to pro bono. We have a pro bono honor roll here uh, that has uh, hundreds and hundreds of members because we have a, co a, a comment to our rule which, which says, in essence, our expectation is that you will perform a certain number of hours of pro bono or you will contribute a certain amount of money and we enforce that by honoring them for doing it. You want to be on the honor roll. And we publish those names. So we do things to encourage the bar. We honor them. We, we extol the, the virtues that they, they embody by the work they do. And we, at the same time, uh, uh, make sure that others know this is what your t peers are doing. So I think it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's got to be uh, a holistic sort of approach uh, from all different angles. But ultimately, again, I, I, I think D Judge Tatel's got it right. It's, it, is, uh, it is a help, but it is, it's still, uh, we got to do more. We have to do more. Judge Tatel, could I ask you to um, uh, give a little insight into um, <coughs> some of the differences or what are the issues um, for civil legal aid in the federal courts as opposed to the state courts and what are you seeing? Well, you know, sitting on a federal appeals court, I mean, virtually most, most of the major cases we see, uh, 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 there, there, there is counsel. We have the ability to appoint counsel. Uh, sure, we have many uh, pro se cases in the district court and the court of appeals, um, but you know we have generally the staff uh, to make sure uh, those cases are handled handled well. The the problem in the federal courts is just not the same as it is. I mean, uh, as my colleagues here on the state courts are facing, it's uh, it's a it's a completely different order of magnitude. Um, but l let me just say a couple of other things just to clarify my original point, if I could. Um, uh, 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 my point, well, I was really pleased to hear what Judge Washington just said, because, uh, you know, we, we can, we can uh, wring our hands and say, uh, it's too, it, it would be too difficult or take too long to get the legal profession to assume its responsibility, or that lawyers will object to it. But if we think, if we truly think I mean, maybe some of you don't agree with me about the responsibility of the profession, but if we do think that this is a professional responsibility that is meeting, meeting the needs of, of, the, of, the, of the country, then, then uh, if we can reach a consensus on that, then we can go to work on how to make it happen. Um, and, you know, both uh, Justice Liu and Judge Washington talked about the importance of legal education in terms of uh, producing lawyers who truly understand their professional responsibility and who, no matter how successful in their lives, will not feel fulfilled 
as long as they're part of a profession that is failing as miserably as this one is to meet the needs of uh, the countries, uh, the, to meet the legal needs of the country. So, uh, and, and, and what's happening in DC and Massachusetts gives me a great deal of confidence that taking the right steps, we could do that. Now, two other points. Number one, I'm not suggesting that this is only the responsibility of the legal profession. Of course it's not. Uh, government has a responsibility, federal, state, and local. Uh, the whole, we all have an investment in the effectiveness of our judicial system. Our country depends on the rule of law and it will not succeed unless our judicial system works and all elements of society have a responsibility. My only point is that lawyers uniquely have a responsibility here. Uh, this is our legal system. We are all officers of the court. Uh, you need to be a lawyer to get into the court and the, it is the legal profession. It's the lawyers in them who have this unique responsibility to not just enlist the aid of others, not just to go to Congress and ask for money, but to make sure that uh, they're getting the job done. The second point is, I wasn't suggesting this as an alternative to all of the other enormously rich ideas we just heard here today. Um, I mean, some of these suggestions that uh, my colleagues here have suggested are fascinating and innovative and I think can make a big difference, but I guess my bottom line is that we have been working on this problem for decades. We've been coming up with innovative ideas for decades. And we are making progress, there's no question about it. But the problem is much bigger. And unless we think bigger about the solutions, I fear we won't really solve the problem. So. Yeah, I, I, I just have to follow up because I think that we, we also have new partners uh, in this fight. Uh, I, I heard um, Justice Liu uh, remark about the Public Welfare Foundation, Mary McClymont, who's here, and the efforts that she's making. She, she uh, recently uh, in invited me to participate on a panel in front of the Council on Foundations, and we had foundations who are interested in issues of poverty who are finally connecting the importance of, 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 of financing, or at least the, the connection between poverty and, and the need to provide civil legal services, that same connection I was talking about that you could cost out and the impact on families. There is a broader conversation being, being um, had because, as was pointed out, it is a nonpartisan issue. When the issue of civil legal aid is brought to the general public, it's the lack of knowledge about what this means because they've been watching TV shows and they think everything's law and order and everybody gets a lawyer and they're appointed and they go in. They really, those who have not had the impact of having to go to court be, to seek services without a lawyer are, are really, to a large degree, um, um, fooled if, if, into thinking they're gonna be okay and they're gonna be defended and protected. Um, right now, and I see Martha Bergmark back there who's doing some work, uh, uh, voices, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot the name. Voices for legal, uh, voices for civil justice. Thank you. Um, uh, who's who's done a great deal of public relations work and knows how that and, and, and has been able to um, uh, help to take the message out beyond and, and is available as a resource for all of you as you go back to 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 have messages that resonate with people because, it, again, it's a large part of this is education, helping them to understand. I, again, beyond having, as I mentioned, Peter Edelman is my chair, a new member of my Access to Justice, of the Access to Justice Commission here in the District of Columbia. I'm very parochial, I call him my all the time. The Access to Justice Commission here in the District of Columbia is Jim Sandman, the President of Legal Services Corporation, who, who is as articulate as, as, he, as anyone about the, 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 the dearth of resources out there and it will go anywhere to talk. So all I'm suggesting is we, there are other players out here now, education, communication, bringing in a groups, uh, uh, foundations who may be interested in poverty and connecting them to the, the need to provide civil legal sa services, civil legal aid. Civil legal aid actually is a great, I mean, people like that according to uh, our polling. <laughs> and uh, so use it. And that's all I want to say. I believe the, um, the show where the people don't have the lawyers is called Judge Judy. <laughs> um, and you see how that goes. Um, sometimes people are good advocates for themselves, but sometimes they're not. 
Um, I would just say that one thing I've benefited enormously from just in the last hour is listening to the ideas of my colleagues around the country. And um, it strikes me that, um, you know, although I know there are national meetings of the, of the different access and justice commissions, it would be so helpful to have more of this kind of thing. Um, also to figure out how um, the, the judges in different states can collectively, uh, whether it's you know, in front of the foundation world or, or to, the, to the more general public, communicate this message. Um, I've gotten some great ideas from all of you, actually, about how to, how to communicate the message. And I think that um, it, it would uh, be amplified even more uh, if, if the states uh, acted in concert on, on something like this. It's nonpartisan, and, it, and it's, you know, everyone supports it, but it's a question of permeating uh, yes. the message. So very sadly, we are out of time, but I want to give each of the judges an opportunity if they want to say anything in closing um, before we adjourn uh, and go to our reception. Um, so if anyone has a final thought that they want to leave with our audience, um, please speak up now. If and hold them from the reception. And hold them from the reception. I know. It's, well, this is so mesmerizing. I think people are happy. Um, but so let's thank these wonderful judges for sharing. <laughs>